Dr. Whitman will be giving us strategies for stopping the blame and guilt that so many ADHD moms live with, as well as, in response to your questions, providing tips to help you survive and even and thrive with this adult disorder. Dr. Whitman is an internationally recognized clinical psychologist. She's worked in the field of attention disorders for almost 30 years. She specializes in identifying and treating complex presentations of ADHD with specific expertise in issues affecting women and girls, which as many of you know are, can be quite different from those affecting men. Dr. Lippmann is the author or co-author of numerous books, including Understanding Girls with ADHD, Understanding Women with ADHD, Gender Differences in ADHD, and many others. Please uh, visit her website, Dr. Ellen Lippmann, L-I-T-T-M-A-N dot com for more information. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lippmann. There's a huge uh, number of women out there looking forward to hearing from you, and we're so grateful for your time. I'm really happy to be here, and uh, it's, it's good to know that people need to hear this, and I, I want to give as much information as I can. That's great. Um, before Dr. Lippmann starts, let me just mention a few items. If this is one of your first webinars, please post your questions in the box. You are muted. Dr. Lippmann will review her slides with you, and then she'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Um, if you have problems hearing us, dial in via your phone line, and that's the best solution. And after the session, you'll find Dr. Lippmann's slides and the audio of this broadcast on the Attitude website, attitudemag.com slash webinars. Down the road, you'll also find a podcast version on the ADHD Experts audio series in iTunes. There's some 90 uh, podcasts there, wonderful topics of all kinds, and I urge you to, to take a look. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Lippmann, and we look forward to her comments. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is just letting you know that being a mom is challenging for every woman, and I don't think there are any exceptions to that. Uh, and it is even more difficult if you're a mom with ADHD. Um, as my uh, friend Sari Solden has said, this is really the job from hell in that Everything that you need to do in terms of organizing and prioritizing and time management and um, balancing everyone's needs, all of those things require a perfect choreography of the executive functions of the brain. And probably most of you know that uh, that is one of the things that's impaired in the world of ADD. Um, I tend to say ADD instead of ADHD. They're interchangeable in terms of my talk. but. It goes faster if I say ADD. Uh, and so these things are actually more difficult. Um, and parenting advice, and there is a lot of parenting advice out there, is actually not written for you. It is not written for moms with ADD. It is uh, so that they suggest things that if you are already organized and not time challenged, um, then you can do those things, but otherwise you try to do the things that they suggest and they're still hard for you and you feel even worse and more alone. Uh, so what I want to do is um, normalize your experience uh, and validate that what's going on for you is going on for uh, millions of other women um, and that this is not hard because you have characterological flaws, uh, or because you're not trying hard enough, but that there are things that really do get in the way. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that get in the way, and then some of the ways that we can circumvent those things. So in terms of uh, cognitive regulation, this is all about different kinds of self-regulation um, and how each one is a different kind of a struggle. Um, in, in terms of disorganization, um, it is, everyone says, it's hard to organize your child when it's not easy for you to organize yourself or their things. Um, and this is something that people feel like they must be able to organize themselves. And, and one of the ways to approach this is to um, get help even from your children, that this is uh, something that everyone's going to work on together. And I'm going to talk about that more. Um, uh, unreliable memory. Uh, 
really affects giving out consequences. Consequences really need to be predetermined and immediate because it's stressful for you to come up with consequences uh, when you're not feeling particularly reasonable at those moments and that you can't always remember the punishments or even the infraction. Um, but the point is that neither can your child and so um, creating a set of consequences uh, that everyone knows about earlier on um, saves you all of that agonizing. The problem with inconsistent stimulation is that for your brain there are certain things that are going to be uh, interesting and to focus on and high stimulation for you and some of the rote parts of uh, house tending and child caretaking are actually pretty boring and they're boring to your brain and you may be saying to your brain we have to pay attention to this and your brain is really saying this is way too boring uh, and so that kind of inconsistency, you know, is, is not you deciding to not pay attention to something, but it is really uh, finding a way to make it more uh, interesting and stimulating to your brain. And I, I'll talk about that later as well, ways to do that. And to be aware that uh, restlessness is something, even though you may not be hyperactive in any way, there's an inner restlessness, a cognitive restlessness, an emotional restlessness um, that makes it hard to keep your mind in one place. M many women have said to me that it's almost impossible for them to sit on the floor and play a board game because their minds can't stay with that. And so some of these things are things that you may be aware of but that you may be labeling yourself in a negative way if you can't do those things, as opposed to saying, okay, this is part of my brain wiring, okay, so what do I do now? But it's accepting that some of these things are part of the wiring and not part of you not trying hard enough. Um, and the binary world view, which is that things tend to be made into a black and white view, um, so that it makes it really easier for you to figure out that there, there aren't as many shades of gray. I, I could do this or I could do this. Uh, but the problem is in making um, those decisions, you have to leave out a lot of the information that, would, that might be more helpful to you. Again, it's um, about accepting, okay, this is why I'm choosing to do this that way. I mean, this is also what my brain is choosing to do. And then so understand that that will affect your choices, but that it is a shorthand that's working for you right now. Okay, similarly, in the world of emotional regulation, the biggest issue for um, for, well, I think for people in general with ADD, but for women specifically, and this is just becoming uh, recognized, uh, it, it wasn't even considered one of the uh, symptoms of ADD until recently, is emotional hyperreactivity, which is whatever the trigger is, you'll probably react a little uh, quicker, a little more intensely, it may stay with you a little longer. Um, and that will basically uh, sort of skew your responses. So there's already a low frustration tolerance, and so more things are going to be triggers. Um, often it's a way to think about it, although I, I don't know if they use this um, metaphor anymore, is a canary in a coal mine. They used to um, send canaries into coal mines to see if there was a, a dangerous gas in there because they would be the vulnerable ones who would sort of respond quickly first. And, um, and ADD women are sort of those canaries in the coal mine that you're going to react first to whatever is going on um, physiologically in your environment. And the first thing that people feel is a sense of irritability. And it's a, it's a physiological irritability, but you're, you're not necessarily aware that's what's going on. Uh, but you start feeling uncomfortable and a little bit frustrated uh, and, and, uh, a, and a little bit restless. 
um, and it's really about starting to have an emotion come up um, and not really be able to um, identify that. Um, and the next thing that happens for many, many moms is, uh, you know, what I call a tsunami of anger. And um, a tsunami in that it overwhelms like a tidal wave, and it makes it so that you really can't think clearly anymore for the moments that, that you know, you can only see the anger. And uh, that is obviously very uncomfortable and dangerous to everybody. Uh, so some of it is about you know, recognizing that the irritability is the first sign, a red flag that um, some emotion is on its way. Um, and then there are going to be feelings of anxiety. A lot of people describe franticness and agitation and panic um, and, you know, leading to getting overwhelmed. Again, um, it, the tendency is to ignore those early signs of feeling uncomfortably anxious, trying to get done what you need to get done, but then when it's uh, almost too late, you realize you're so overwhelmed that, you know, you can't think clearly. And the same thing happens with depressive feelings uh, where uh, you start feeling uh, a little bit uh, sad about not being able to cope the way you want to, and by the time um, you know, you really start to look at it or acknowledge what's going on, you're feeling pretty hopeless. So uh, this is something that is just a moment-to-moment -moment, uh, reactivity, and it's good to know that that is operating. And, and again, these are things to just be aware you're coping with every moment, uh, and it helps you understand why your job is so difficult. Uh, the physiological regulation is just your body trying to respond to all kinds of hypersensitivities, whether it's um, uh, sounds that are too loud or distracting sounds uh, outside your window or uh, smells that are too strong or, uh, or you know, just being touched in the wrong way. Um, you know, there's, there's often issues when uh, a bad fit where one person wants to be touched, a child and a mother, and the other, child, uh, the other person does not feel as comfortable being touched. This is, uh, you know, endlessly uh, upsetting for both parties, and it really has to do with hypersensitivity, not with how people feel about each other. One of the most important things to talk about is estrogen. What we are finding out with research um, is that uh, estrogen for women is really tightly tied to the experience of uh, one's ADD symptoms. And the fluctuations in estrogen uh, absolutely have a, a, an influence on all of the things we're talking about in terms of your ability to regulate. And um, when um, estrogen is higher, your dopamine levels are higher, and, and when it's uh, lower, um, just before your period, uh, all of the symptoms are uh, amplified. So understanding the, the role that estrogen plays in, um, your, you know, it's, the brain is a target or organ for estrogen, which most people don't realize, so that uh, all of your cognitive functions are affected by by estrogen levels, and uh, the the fluctuations can really undermine you. And it's important to know that that's part of what's going on in your system. And again, to be aware of it, that's something you can't control. And then one of the things it affects is uh, sleep cycles. And sleep deprivation um, is deadly because it it again it intensifies. Uh, ADD symptoms. It makes it harder to concentrate. It makes you more frustrated. It makes you have a shorter fuse. And uh, it's almost always happening in a, a household where uh, there's ADD. Um, and then there's um, self-medicating with food and uh, or other substances. But the thing that is important that I say about food is that the, um, the ADD brain does not metabolize glucose. Uh, uh, 
really successfully and it always thinks that there's not enough glucose for energy in the brain so it keeps saying to you send up more glucose in the form of you know it wants you to eat um, carbohydrates or sugary things so it'll be converted into glucose so you find yourself drawn to carbohydrates and you can be labeling yourself, oh, it's disgusting, why am I eating all these carbohydrates? So I just want you to know that your brain is really demanding that, um, and uh, so that it's not your imagination. Your brain is not saying, send up some more salad. It is saying, uh, we need you to eat bread or pasta or bagels um, so that it will be converted into glucose. Okay. Um, and then the behavioral regulation is, okay, so all of those things are going on inside you. How do you end up uh, responding? And um, it, it ends up being a, a certain kind of rigidity of making those binary choices. Okay, I've decided this is the right way to do it and this is the wrong thing to do, uh, which ends up having extreme consequences. Again, very black and white. Um, and you know, you can put out, uh, you know, a black and white uh, demand, uh, but then when children get angry at you, um, you don't want to provoke a confrontation, so a lot of people put out those demands and get very anxious about them and then back off from them. It creates a really confusing uh, place for you to be. Uh, you end up censoring yourself. You don't want us spouse angry at you. You don't want your peers angry at you when you take a, a rigid position. Um, and a lot of women are concerned that uh, the two choices are if they're uh, intense about their position, then they uh, seem, feel they are uh, aggressive. And the other end of the continuum is sort of being a passive victim, and they feel like those are the two choices that they have. Um, and there really are a lot of other choices on the continuum, but you can't see them at that moment because your brain is only choosing to see the highest stimulation choices. Um, and, and what goes with those binary choices is that you're going to do it perfectly or not at all. And that, that, you know, there's a lot of obsessive overlay, particularly for uh, women. Um, and uh, they get focused on the details of uh, what needs to be done and can even become pretty perfectionistic, which are very intense demands on you. Um, and, uh, and, and that makes it even more rigid. I mean, there's, if you say, set yourself up that this has to be done perfectly, there's only one way to go from there, and that is seeing that you're failing. On top of all of those things are societal expectations, which is that um, women with ADD um, don't fit the feminine ideal because the feminine ideal is pretty crazy. Um, and it expects you to um, do all of these things cooperatively and organizing everybody and, um, you know, not complaining and, you uh, um, you know, and looking great while you do it, and um, these setting up social lives and your house, and it's it's unrealistic, really, for anyone. And there's the part of you that um, gets that that's unrealistic, but there's also the part of you that pursues it anyway, and that's the conflict that I just want to point out is that um, you can recognize um, that some of these things don't make sense, but you still can hear yourself saying, but I know I should. And as soon as you hear that word should, you know that you're on the train towards uh, trying to conform to uh, societal expectations that fit almost no one, but certainly no mom with ADD. And what ends up happening is then, you know, you, you start compare, comparing yourself to people uh, and say, oh, they can do it and I can't, and everyone seems to be coping better than I am, and being ashamed of those differences, um, and believing that people see you as the person not coping well, um, and that this is totally on your shoulders to be able to manage everything perfectly, and if you can't, um, you know, you don't measure up. And what happens when you start feeling that way is that um, you start uh, 
in internalizing negative messages that you've heard growing up, negative messages that you say to yourself. And the smarter you are, the more you start feeling like this should be doable and what is wrong with me that I can't do it. And you start feeling inadequate and unworthy and that people are going to see you as uh, an imposter. You're trying to make it all look good and like you're holding it together, but they're going to find out the chaos that is you know, sort of behind the facade. And a lot of women then start being reluctant to socialize where you know, they can't necessarily keep up with the article in the New Yorker or you know, what, what um, you know, summarizing the issues in a recent movie. Uh, because they're busy catching up and they keep their difficulties hidden and uh, and they have very negative conversations with themselves um, about their negative uh, self-image. They don't want to seem needy. They don't want to ask for help. They want to uh, look like they have it together. But the reality is that your life is not just what's happening to you, but it's also the quality of your existence and how hard it is. And if you keep that hidden, uh, no one really gets to know you. And when you, you're unknown, like it interferes with intimacy with your significant other. Uh, they don't know what you're coping with and you don't necessarily want to share all that frustration. Uh, but then there becomes sort of a wall where um, you know, they are not understanding what your experience is and it becomes very lonely. And then the tolls um, are high, um, that there is just chronic stress. You're unable to relax, you don't feel entitled to relax, you always feel like you're trying to catch up. But that is not good for your body. It saps your resources. It lowers your resistance. And, um, and it makes it more likely that you're going to get sick. Um, and, um, and then you don't necessarily attend to your own self-care because you're attending to everyone else's first. Your, your health maintenance is on the back burner. So um, you don't necessarily get to uh, do anything uh, consistently, take vitamins, exercise, uh, you know, do physical therapy, you're moving fast, there's more injuries, more accidents, uh, you know, bender benders, uh, twisting your ankle, uh, and, and everyone feels like they're supposed to have perfect meals. Um, which is another one of those, um, you know, we need a new yardstick, um, it, but it's something that women are always demanding of themselves and labeling themselves negatively if they don't do it. Um, and, and then you start, you invalidate yourself and then you accept invalidation from other people saying that you're not doing a good enough job and, um, you know, even accepting, you know, uh, abusive comments from your children who, um, you know, also have ADD and can get really angry. And, uh, and you start making negative assumptions about how others see you and, uh, and, and you can start wanting to withdraw from people and isolating. And then that loss of perspective, uh, you know, when you're alone with these thoughts can lead to a lot of hopelessness. So that there's a cycle that can become really negative um, if um, you, you don't find other ways of coping. And, and so in the survival um, range, the first thing to do is to acknowledge your own ADD and that it does impact you and it impacts your family. Um, you can be so focused on your children's ADD that you may not be thinking about your own and really acknowledging that you know, it's just as serious. It has just as many symptoms. It's extremely far-reaching. Also, acknowledging what we call a bad fit. And however you're wired, it is very likely that your child or one of your children is wired the opposite way. If you're the outgoing, uh, gregarious, um, active, um, talking a lot type of uh, ADD wiring, 
you may have a child who is the withdrawn, tuning out, not, um, overwhelmed by too much stimulation uh, wiring. It, it almost always happens. And then each person is frustrated with the other person's functioning. And that kind of a fit is very, very frustrating. One person is always overwhelmed by too much stimulation coming at them, and the other person is always frustrated by not getting enough of a response from the other person. And, you know, it's, it's a bad fit, but there is no one to blame for that. You're not responsible for it. So one of the things that's important is getting treatment. And again, you, I'm sure you're very focused on treatment for uh, your child, uh, but not necessarily for yourself. But it is important. And I'm not talking I'm medication, not medication, but I am talking about being able to talk to a therapist who gets it, who gets, not just gets ADD, but gets what it's like for mothers with ADD to cope. Um, and I mean, if they get it, then you will truly find some validation and support. And there are other kinds of support systems, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a local chapter of uh, CHAD or some other support group or uh, the special ed parents group uh, through your school or um, you know, letting you know, letting some friends know about what's going on, or l telling your spouse what's going on. But in other words, it is really hard to go this alone, and there's no reason to. But a lot of moms feel this is my sole burden to carry as an albatross, and it is a very heavy burden. So I think it's about respecting your own feelings about how hard this is. Don't a lot of women try to say, "No, I'm I'm overstating that. It's not that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. Uh, why am I complaining and whining?" No, it it is extremely hard. There's no complaining and whining about it. Um, and feel entitled to not take on more. Um, Again, this is part of the societal things about women that they're supposed to say yes and 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 do everything and and that's ridiculous. You've already your plate is over full. Don't say yes to other things. And don't seek out normal. Normal is really it's overrated. It's boring. Um, the idea is not to be normal and linear. It's just to find a way to live and uh, feel good. So in terms of thriving, um, one of the things to do is to, um, to choose your battles. And I'm sure you've heard that before, but that's really hard to do. Um, you, you, have to, you, know, you have to let some things go and just say, these are not that important. Uh, and we can talk later about which things are OK to let go and which aren't. Everyone makes their own choice to some extent. Um, Focus on everyone's strengths, your strengths, your child's strengths, uh, because you know ultimately the things that aren't strengths you're not going to be able to do that much about. And you can either focus on the one thing that is hard or on the fact that everyone's trying hard to do their best. The idea of problem solving together, which means that instead of you figuring out the answer to everything, you can say to your children, and children as young as five can participate in this, we have to solve this problem. What should we do? Uh, and believe it or not, children never say, I don't care. You, you figure it out. Um, I, I want to do nothing. They, they, they like being considered as a responsible party who has input. And you can find a way where, you know, they may have ideas that you haven't even thought of. And it's about solving it together so that it isn't all on your shoulders. That is not a failure. That is a success to realize that delegating is not just a good idea. It's critical to survive. The other thing is to build in downtime, both for your children and for yourself. You need private time to regroup. Even if it's 10 minutes, you owe it to yourself. That, and, and I know that you may feel, I have so much to do, I can't possibly do that. You will be a happier and healthier human being and better able to cope if you accept that you need some downtime um, and that you, you have to 
um, build it in. Nothing happens in the world of ADD unless you actually schedule it in. You can't wait until you find a time that says, this is a good time for downtime. Similarly, spending time enjoying each other means that instead of always dealing with your child in terms of, here's what we have to get done now, here's what we have to get done now, and now we have to do this, that you actually have to schedule some time, even if it's 15, 20 minutes, where we are not going to get anything done. We, uh, we are just not going to have to be constructive. We're going to just do whatever. We're, you know, we're going to color. We're going to talk about you know, something that's fun. We're going to go get ice cream. But something where the interaction between the two of you is just about being together and not about uh, performing and achieving and catching up and what's expected. Uh, because that can become toxic to everybody's system. And accepting that marching to your own drummer is a really great way to go. That um, nobody can decide for you the best way for you to live. And that um, you are judging yourself uh, much more harshly than other people. And that you know, finding, again, that this, you know, something your own yardstick, it's just another way of saying that, that is going to be the path that works for you is the only one that really matters. It doesn't matter what other people are doing because they're not, you know, walking in your shoes. And uh, although it is really hard, it is really important to be able to laugh and to laugh with your kids and to be able to accept when something has been forgotten or um, you're late that this is not um, a horrible failure that defines you. Um, and that is a really good thing to keep for yourself and for your kids. And that, that, um, and that you embrace, uh, you know, effort regardless of the way that, you know, it actually, uh, you know, is done as long as it moves you towards something that you want to do. So, uh, just remember that none of this stuff has to be your responsibility alone and if you engage everybody in this being a process of keeping your family and your home working together, uh, you will not feel so alone with it and you will actually have a staff of helpers who will uh, help you get closer to what you need to do. Okay, so that's, I think, and I, I hope you're seeing the, uh, the last slide, which is actually a quote from Frank Zappa, but I think that it, um, it applies, that, um, that really we move ahead not by doing the same thing as everyone else, but um, that we can embrace deviation from the norm. Uh, the norm is a little bit overrated. Okay, <laughs> so on to questions. Thank you so much. I mean, there's just been outpouring um, on the screen that I'm seeing of women saying, oh my gosh, this is me. Um, when Anne says, this entire seminar could be called Anne's Way of Life. Um, <laughs> and Leslie says, you know, thanks, thanks for helping me put a name to what I've been li living with my whole life. Why is it that you think that women have so little support? I mean, on that, to that point, a number of people have said, you know, there's not a Chad chapter near them. They don't find... Um, that their family recognizes what they're going through. I mean, you know, what can people do to not to feel so alone and so misunderstood? Uh, right. So there are there are several levels to that. I mean, this is one of the first steps because I mean, you have to believe that um, th this is this is about something other than you just not um, not being good enough. And uh, women in our society just tend to go that way. There's a lot of research that says that uh, women tend to internalize uh, their experiences, uh, whereas men really don't. And as a result, um, the um, negative self-talk and um, the low self-esteem is much more an issue for women than for men in general, and then in the world of ADD, much more so for um, women with ADD. So it's, first of all, it's buying into the fact that this really is a huge problem and it's not your fault. Um, and it is true that, that in many 
many parts of the country, it is hard to, uh, to find anybody who uh, has this viewpoint. It's still relatively new. Um, I mean, we're only really embracing now that, I mean, first uh, th that um, girls could have ADD, which is, you know, what our book was about, and then that adults could have ADD, and that, um, you know, especially high-functioning women with ADD look so different than hyperactive boys with ADD that that very few you know I mean people in society I mean whether it's your your um, your internist or whether it's your friends or whether it's uh, educators they're not going to say oh I see that that um, it's clear you're struggling with ADD so no one is going to label that for you and then there's this there's the societal expectations the, the general expectations are women are supposed to have it all together and uh you know be super women and uh and unfortunately a lot of people buy into that not in necessarily intellectually but emotionally they still do so it's knowing that that's really uh, we've been sold a bill of goods on that, and that right. this is this is really really hard. And everyone is is entitled to say these are the things that are hard for me. This is what I need help with. Um, but right now, women are not that comfortable doing that, so that they are all leading, um, in some ways, secret lives. Um, they present a facade of, uh, you know, I look like other women and, and my kids are dressed like uh, your kids and we're all signed up for the same after school classes. But the, the chaos and the struggle and the pain and the torment that you're living with is, is, is the secret that you live with. But that's the stuff that will undo your life. Not whether or not you know your kids are ten minutes late, or uh, whether or not they forgot the um, you know the the form in order to be able to go on the field trip. But it is it is that kind of toxic feeling that you have about yourself that is is going to be the thing that's ruining the quality of your life. So it is about finding ways to hear other voices and you know there are there are some sites on the internet not that many where you can find like-minded uh, women talking about this um, and uh, but a lot of times you have to be the one who buys into it and even has to start that conversation and it's a scary conversation to start uh, because a lot of people feel that it exposes vulnerability because they're seeing it as it, as personal characterological vulnerability when when it's not it's like you're the most competent women in the world but you know you have one hand tied behind your back because of a uh, brain wiring uh, but it's really sometimes very hard for women to buy into that that was a very long answer but I feel very passionately yeah. about this. <laughs> Um, I just want to mention a couple of support places. One is uh, called the Virtual Chad Chapter. It's at chad.org. If you don't know Chad, it's a wonderful national support um, organization for people with ADHD. Um, and also on ADD Connect, which is Attitude Magazine's support network, there are tons of people talking about all things related to attention deficit disorder and living with it. So those are just two areas. I'm sure there are others as well. And I, I think online may be the best place for those of you who are isolated in terms of finding support. I know we get letters all the time at Attitude saying, thank goodness, I'm, you know, there are people being discussed who understand me. So it's really important not to feel alone. I, I really agree with Dr. Lippman on that. Um, Dr. Lippman, a number of people have also asked more for more about the hormone connection. They, I think many people feel they've not heard that before. Um, right. One person said, you know, when I was pregnant, I was like a Wonder Woman. I got everything done. Exactly. And other people said, you know, when I was, um, I hit Mary, Mary menopause, my symptoms got much worse. Worse. So yes. the, the estrogen connection is pretty important. And what do you suggest about that? People are wanting to know, is, is hormone treatment the answer? Is it ADHD medication? Um, how do you cope with the hormonal implications and uh, effect on ADHD. Okay, I mean it, it is so critically important. It is very new research so that, I mean, you can ask, you know, but why is this? And not only can I not answer that, but at this moment researchers can't answer exactly why mm -hmm. as much as we now know 
wow, it's, it's, it's implicated in absolutely everything. It's, it's implicated in women in terms of them, um, their responses to food, their addiction to, uh, to cigarettes. We're finding it, it's, it's in, in, with sleep. Um, so this is a whole separate ball game from what um, men are dealing with. So what we know is, and in fact, this is one of the reasons that uh, they didn't even realize that uh, girls had um, ADD, because for girls, ADD symptoms don't really show up in force until estrogen starts showing up in their systems. So um, you really start getting in the intensity of mood symptoms after you start getting your period. And since the cutoff for ADD symptoms used to be age seven, uh, girls tended not to uh, you know, look like they had symptoms. Uh, by the time they're 16, 17, um, you know, suddenly everyone has, um, has ADD symptoms. Um, and so the, the fluctuations during the month very much affect how um, you're going to be feeling at different times. Um, they have shown that taking estrogen does improve your symptoms, but Obviously, there. I, although you know, it changes from month to month what the risks are of that. But I don't think anyone's advising that that's the way to cope. Um, you know, medication does help with that. They even have. Um, uh, they are using um, uh, antidepressant in the ten days before uh, people's periods to uh, level out the right. um, some of the symptoms. Um, so right now, how to treat it is, you know, is still in the, you know, no one is clear about the best answer for that. The important part is to know that it's operating. So in other words, starting at about, I don't know, 38, then your, your, uh, your estrogen, estrogen starts decreasing in your system, that symptoms uh, do start to get worse, and by the time you get to perimenopause, it really it is having an impact on your system. And uh, and then you know when you get to to menopause, I, I have women come in who have never sought treatment before, but they all are like, why is this suddenly happening to me now? And it's even if you had you know a lot of good compensating techniques in place, uh, that sudden drop in estrogen makes it. Uh, hard for you to think. It, it, uh, verbal memory is is a sacrifice. Sleep problems, uh, you know, concentration, um, irritability. There's so many ways. Mood, all of those things are affected by uh, estrogen. So we really didn't know that before. So it really is absolutely the combination of you know, dopamine and estrogen. Those two right. things together. Whereas for other people, it's just the dopamine. You know, so it's. Um, I mean, it's just a huge thing to know, and to know that, unfortunately, as you get older, it is just, um, you know, it's it's another thing that's piling on, and yes, it's not fair. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, is it? Um, um, let's see. Uh, one, one, I'm looking at this, many, many questions. Um, one common question is, how do I communicate this? If I come to accept my own ADHD, and feel good about it. How do I communicate that to my friends, to the in the workplace, to my family? Um, it's still seen as an excuse, or people feel that it's an excuse. What, what do you advise people in terms of talking with others or enlisting support and others in their network? Get, once they, once we accept our ADHD and have come to terms with it. Right. I, I mean, and and that is the biggest deal because you say the words. You know, you say ADD out in the world. People have a million ideas of what that is in their heads. There is not a consistent idea. There, you know, people don't understand what it is. Um, you know, even among the people listening today, it's like it's uh, many people are still seeing it differently. It, it's hard to get your head around, um, and so a lot of people are thinking in terms of excuse when it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation. And it is a, a totally physiological explanation. It, it, it is just it is just about the way your brain is wired, um, and uh, and it's particularly hard. The, the smarter you are, 
and the better you compensate, the more likely people will doubt you. It's a horrible catch-22. So the harder that you struggle to cope and stay up late in the night and, you know, try to hold everything together, the, the more likely it is that someone will say to you, that's ridiculous, of course you don't have ADD, look at you, you're, you know, <laughs> whatever it is that you're, you, you're succeeding at, but you're succeeding at the cost of unbelievable anxiety and depression and all sorts of other things. Um, so it's, I mean, there are things to read. I have things on my website that, that explain something in three or four pages that you can download about, um, you know, one's called What the ADHD Brain Wants and Why, which is just explains really quickly, I mean, why even when you intend to do something, you know, how you and your brain are sometimes at odds with one another. Um, and um, also, you know, just what a woman's uh, experience is like so that, um, you know, they can be hearing it from somewhere other than you. Um, and uh, that always seems to work better they, um, with, and for everyone. I mean, it has nothing to do with you, but it's just that they need to hear it from other sources. Um, and, uh, but, I mean, I think once people understand it, um, you know, at, then they can become, you know, part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And, you know, I try so hard to get people to engage uh, their significant others so that it is a team uh, rather than hiding it from the significant other. Um, and that has to do with feeling um, entitled to believe that this is, it, you know, that the societal expectations are completely off from what is realistic for anybody and that this is, you know, these are just, this is the fallout of this kind of brain wiring and certain things are easy, certain things are, are can be amazing in terms of uh, you know, creativity and, and enthusiasm and intensity, but certain things are going to be hard and you have to find an answer to that. Uh, so it's about feeling entitled to have that conversation. Yeah, I think many people are saying, I, I can't share this with my spouse, my spouse is not empathetic. Um, right. So, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, um, I think. Um, can we turn to back to the comment you made about glucose? I think in a, in a recent um, session with Dr. Russell Barkley, he also mentioned glucose specifically and ad actually advised drinking a, glu a, a sugary drink. Um, is, that, is that something that you also um, have seen in your mention about the ADA symptoms make you call out for glucose? Um, yeah, again, this is one of those things like the estrogen that we don't have the answer to the best way to handle this yet. Uh, you know, it's just science mm -hmm. marching on. But th the thing we do know is that um, the ADHD brain thinks that it needs more glucose. It, 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 it doesn't necessarily, it just doesn't metabolize it um, as well as oh. other brains. Um, so that it's really about understanding, okay, whether it's a sugary drink or, uh, but, uh, I mean, for, for women especially, carbs have the added benefit of, uh, they also increase serotonin, and that sort of can numb you out a little bit, so it, it takes the edge off the franticness. So the combination of those two things of, um, you know, sort of, of giving your brain what it wants in terms of energy and calming you down is a, a really, you know, a, a winning com uh, combination for women. And that's why, uh, you know, carbs and uh, sugary things, and especially chocolate, which has, you know, it's the trifecta because it also <laughs> has caffeine, um, you know, so it does all of those things. Uh, but understanding that, the, I mean, what you're doing is you are medicating the um, neurotransmitter uh, uh, unbalance in your brain. That is what you're doing. You're not just saying, uh, you know, to hell with my diet and I'm going to eat carbs and I don't care. It is literally your brain is saying this is what we need to function better. And uh, it's just another way of... Um, trying to get the kind of stimulation that will allow you to focus. Right, okay. Um, maybe we could just turn in our last minutes here to some practical uh, tips that you might want to suggest. There's some wonderful comments. Um, 
one person says, um, I can't get the children to school on time. Last, last semester, my kids had five tardy marks on the report card. And someone right. else chimed in and said, boy, I wish my kids only had five. It's more like 15, um, right. 15 tardies. Um, so, you know, she said that it's really hard to get out the door on time, especially when your kids also have ADHD. Right. Have anything to offer these moms who would, you know, this is one of the big moments for ADHD moms at getting out the door in the morning. There is no question. I think that it is, I think the mornings are the single uh, most uh, horrible <laughs> time of the day and, you know, many women will burst into tears if they get their children on the bus. Um, uh, so there's a couple of things to say about it. I mean, one is to realize that the, 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 it, the ultimate goal, you may think that the ultimate goal is to get your kids to school at exactly the right time. Uh, but I might, I might argue and say that the ultimate goal is to get your kids to school without any of you feeling like, you know, your lives are not worth living. And very often uh, what ends up happening is there's so much fighting and screaming and blaming um, that uh, you know that 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 isn't worth it. Now, I mean that this is not addressing. Okay, so what exactly should I do? There's a thousand different pieces. There are a thousand different moving pieces in getting kids to school on time, um, and um, a lot of it has to do with you know taking your own ADD into account and understanding that it isn't going to work like a, you know a finely oiled clock and part of that is your kids and part of that is you um, and so that uh, you know building in the extra time for all of the distractions you have as well as your kids and all the things that get in the way has something to do with it but I'm not saying oh then you can just do that and everything will be fine um, there are many pieces to it, but what I'm saying is that um, th this is, a, I mean, uh, you know, obviously schools don't like children to be late either, but I think that you have to balance, you know, the quality of what goes on and, you know, if you can accept, okay, we have a bunch of people with ADD here and we're doing the best we can to do this and try to keep the focus on we're all working together to get out the door. Um, as opposed to, you know, you are thwarting me in my goal to get this done, I think that, uh, you know, relationships will feel better. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the kids are, are going to say, you, you, you know, it was horrible, you yelled at me in the morning, or you'll be saying, I feel horrible, I yelled at my kids in the morning, as opposed to any of you saying, um, you know, but my kids were five minutes late and that was the disaster of the day. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a, a reframing what's important in terms of creating the yardstick that works for you and um, making everybody's uh, emotional experience of their lives a little higher on the rating scale. Okay. Um, there's a lot of funny comments. I wish you all could see it. You know, one person says, yeah, the truant off officer is threatening to call us. And another one says, my kid had 17 tardies. You know, so there's like, and there's one that says yep. 25. So um, yep. this is a really common problem, you know, and it leads to another problem, which um, Ashley brings up. She says, you know, I have lists everywhere. I'm multiple lost, forgotten lists. I have unfinished projects to-do lists. I exist in a constant state of rushing and catching up. And what I'm really afraid of is that my children will have no benchmark for what normal is like in, in life. Um, right. And that's so typical, too, because she's worried about her kids rather than herself. But, but yeah, I think there is, there is a consensus here among the moms that they don't want their children to grow up in this kind of chaos. Right. Um, well, and you know, children uh, are not aware uh, really that it's chaos for quite a long time, that they understand that other families uh, run differently. But one of the things that you can do is acknowledge these things are hard for me. And uh, you can, you know, there are people that you can, uh, it, you know, if, if I think the school offers some, uh, some if you can afford them, there are, you know, sort of there are, there are tutors and organizational people who can sort of help everyone organize so that, you know, you're not trying to pretend that this is the right way to do it, but it's not, the, you know, it's like this is a difficult thing, 
and we all have trouble doing it. Right. Um, so that um, things can be put in place for everyone, but everyone has to be working together on it. And that's why spouses being involved is, is a huge part of it, um, you know, rather than uh, being judged uh, by yet another source, uh, you know, if being late is, and there's no question, being late to school is a big deal. Truant officers are out there. I, you know, I write letters <laughs> to schools all the time trying really? to, you know, I mean, all the time, uh, because there is, I'm not going to say there aren't uh, sometimes real world consequences, um, but nonetheless, um, even those real world consequences don't make your brain better at this, you know, so that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so sometimes everyone can learn together other ways to do it, um, you know, and helping, asking, you know, kids for help, having baskets around, every kid has their own basket and they have to deal with their own stuff in some way, even if they just take their basket of stuff and put their toys or their clothes in it and dump it in their room, it's at least, it's a concept that, you know, organizing the entire world of your family is not yours alone and is difficult and, um, and you know, is something that everyone can learn uh, right. you know, and needs to learn. There's some, some, some wonderful suggestions being posted. Belinda says, we had 67 tardies and now my son's in boarding school, which is the best solution for us. <laughs> um, someone else says, you know, there are IEPs and 504 plans which allow being late as an accommodation. It's yep. an interesting one. And then there's a coach, um, Mary, on the, um, let me find her, her post here, who says she works often with people on this issue and that, it's Mary Smith, her name is, and it has to be a family-specific solution that there's no magic bullet, that for each family coming up with a morning routine is pretty much unique to, um, to their life. So um, that makes sense. Um, all right, well, um, here's someone, someone says, how about an IEP for parents? That's great. Um, right. We are out right. of time. This has been such a wonderful webinar. I really can't thank you enough. You'll have to come back and talk mm, some I had more so much more to say. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we really, you know, there are so many people who have really, this has meant so much to them. And um, I know we could go much farther down the road of tips. And uh, this is the best webinar I've ever listened to, Michelle Posts. So thank you so much again, and thank you all for participating. Which is, which, which I'll repeat her website. Okay, it's Doctor, um, Doctor, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Doctor Ellen Littman com. So it's D R D R Ellen L I T T M Littman L I T T M A N dot com. So yeah. yes, please check it out and. Uh, Come back to the website, AttitudeMag.com webinars for her slides, which I think are great. And um, thank you all again, and we look forward to having Dr. Lippman back again another time.